Welcome, everyone. So this is the, uh, the Monty Ahuja Distinguished Lecture Series. So uh, just a brief note about this, what this seminar is. That I think, as you know, this is uh, a special seminar. This is not our typical department seminar, but one we put a whole lot more emphasis on. Uh, and credit vision, his vision in creating this seminar series. So it's named after Monty and Ahuja. Uh, Monty and Usha Ahuja uh, is the Distinguished Lecture Series. And the, the aim here is to attract highly accomplished and illustrious individuals, as well as those on their way to national and international renown. And so it's uh, to showcase their work of the current experts in the engineering field and to as inspire Ohio State students to achieve excellence and eminence on your own path uh, in your careers in industry, uh, academia, and government. So to that end, uh, it's, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Israel Wignanski. Professor Wignanski uh, uh, is well known in Puma campus. I would say he is the, the uh, advising father and grandfather to many people in the field, uh, many of the researchers that we all cite. Uh, in fact, I am I'm amazed that I find out, oh, you worked with Wiggy, you know, as I talk to people. There's many uh, people out there, and I think that's one of the strongest testaments to. Professor Wignanski's uh, leadership in the field is the number of eminent scholars that he has had an influence on. Uh, Professor Wignanski uh, went to McGill University and earned his doctorate there in 1964. Uh, and then he uh, established himself uh, quite successfully in fluid mechanics over the years. Um, he started off as an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia. Uh, and then he moved to Boeing, where he worked uh, for about seven years as a senior research scientist and uh, did a lot of fundamental research in the back when Boeing was doing good fundamental research. Uh, and then he moved to Israel where he was the Lazarus Professor of Aerodynamics uh, and then also department head and dean of the Faculty of Engineering at Tel Aviv University. Uh, then after his time at Tel Aviv, he moved to the University of Arizona where he's now a professor in their uh, Department of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering. Uh, and along the way, he's also invested significant time at NASA, uh, basically an extended period where he was working with uh, NASA researchers. And uh, I think one of the things that's intriguing to me about his scholarly journal journey is the uh, pathway from Journal of Fluid Mechanics fundamental research papers all the way to flight testing of the sweeping jet uh, flow control uh, actuators on the 757. So I think it's a very impressive breadth of excellence and across that spectrum of fundamental to apply. Uh, so, Professor Wignanski, thank you for coming to your best time with us, and uh, we look forward to hearing your thoughts for us today. Thanks, Jim, and uh, it's great to be here. I'm just uh, thinking about all the sins that you mentioned in my hand. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I put my, the topic as a, more as a question mark. Should active flow control become a design tool in aerodynamics? And uh, obviously I have an to drive here. And so uh, I'll try to convince you that it should. So uh, let me go and go over a little bit of um, the way things are being used now uh, in design very briefly about things that I know very little, but uh, I think they should be put in the right proportion. So, uh, let's see. okay. Now, uh, this multidisciplinary design optimization uh, became one of the ways in which uh, new configurations are being designed. Basically, you see here there is a loop which includes aerodynamic inputs and structural inputs. I think those are the two most important ones. But then, if there are special missions to some airplanes, like observability and so on, uh, they enter into this and they are trying to hash this uh, whole procedure in uh, as quick a way as possible, because you can imagine how many variables you have here and come up with something that appears to be an optimum, like you, you see here at this uh, configuration. So you start, for example, with, uh, 
with a wing, and then you want to do the same thing with the fuselage, and again, you go through the same type of uh, circle, and uh, hopefully you generate something that is uh, performing best to, you, to the mission. However, if you look at some of these papers, um, the predictive schemes to this is not, are not always adequate. And so here is one of these things that shows you a wing, shows you what the experimental results are, and on the other hand, some of the predictions. So the, the predictions mostly, some of them do well up to location of some separation region. The moment the flows start separating, even these predictions don't do very well. Of course, there are some others that do better. Then there are other requirements. Uh, let's say, do you have yoke control on such a configuration? And what you see here is what you get as, uh, uh, from, from this configuration. This is the light color. And what you need to obtain from that configuration in order to be acceptable, and quite often, uh, you see that there is a mismatch there. Uh, if, on the other hand, you try then to optimize your uh, experimental tools, and there is this whole idea of design of experiments, where if you have too many variables, you are trying to see which one you use. Uh, again, my uh, exper experience here, and it's not a wide experience, that you need to have a physical input. You have to understand the physics quite well. Uh, before you play these games. Because if you don't, for example, in this case, this is a kind of a tailless aircraft, which was uh, around 2003, uh, tested at uh, NASA. And obviously, there was a problem here with uh, the leading edge vortex being moving around uh, along the span. So they tried active flow control by blowing here at the leading edge, and what they got was nothing. No result, no improvement. Here this is input levels of momentum, if you wish, and you get nothing here. So uh, again, are we missing something? And uh, what I think we are missing is, again, in this particular case, the physical not always where you see the symptom is where the problem is. Uh, if we go to look at uh, commercial airplanes, where basically the performance is what comes, the uh, lift to drag ratio and so on, uh, what people do is uh, they start with the inviscid solver, they try to make it as fine as possible, as many millions of uh, points, and uh, then they start CFD, and then they come with solution. And so here is an example where you think that aerodynamics had finished its course, because there's a competition for a single eye airplane, commercial airplane, <coughs> basically something of the order of 160 uh, passengers, and uh, all of those airplanes are competing. So there is the Russian MC-21, there is a Boeing 737 MAX, there is an A320 Airbus, there is a Chinese C919, they all take 160 passengers, plus minus three, they all take, uh, they all cost 100 million plus minus maybe three two, <laughs> okay, and you and all that you see here, there is only one point that was much. This is this point here. And what do you see? You see essentially the same airplane. So here are four competing large competing companies. They use the standard procedure, and they come with the same optimal. 
configuration. So where, where is the competition? That's it. So that is in terms of uh, commercial airplanes. And so active flow control can open, in my opinion, the whole new parameter space. But you have to think of active flow control also a little bit historically. How, was, how it would develop? It developed mostly with the jet engine after World War II. It developed, it was pushed mostly by the navies of uh, the US, uh, England, and France, who, built, who had, at, after World War II, relatively small aircraft carriers. And the only type of airplanes that could take off and land on those were, were propeller airplanes. In the meantime, of course, there were jets. And so uh, there was the need to use jets. So what they did, they put in steady blowing and a massive steady blow, something of the order of momentum coefficients of the order of 7 to 10%. And they fixed this. So in other words, the airplane was designed, and then they had the problem to take off from an aircraft carrier. So they put in slots, and they were blowing out of that, and managed. So that way, for example, in uh, the Korean conflict, uh, Jets appeared uh, for the first time uh, from aircraft carrier. But anyway, uh, active flow control, in my opinion, should be something that you put in an input of order of size, small input, and you want to have an output of order one. So when you, the moment you say, I want to have an output of order one, if I look at wings, it means that I would like to change either the direction of the flow or the pressure distribution on the wing or both. And so how do I do it with a small input? In other words, the whole approach of using initially Euler's equations without any active flow control, freezing the design and then adding on active flow control is not fitting within this, uh, this defi these definitions. So active flow control is not boundary layer control. I'm not trying to restore inviscid flow. Okay? So <clears throat> that's first. Now, is it possible to do that? Well, I, had, I happen to have old results from the mid-1960s, which are good examples for that. Uh, in here, this is a flat plate at zero incidence. It shouldn't give any lift. You take a jet out of this plate and you have the jet emerging right in here, parallel to the free stream, and yet you can see the circulation was created. These streamlines are bending in because of jet entrainment. There is a stagnation point that moved down. And if you look at these other thin wings, for example, this is all above and beyond what potential flow gives you. And there is this variation of, in this particular case, where the lift is uh, proportional to the input of momentum, to the square root of the input of momentum. Now, so what does it mean? We want to have an input of epsilon, which means that we are looking into some instability that will take that input of epsilon and amplify it a thousand times, hundred times, or something like that. So the question initially was, uh, turbulent flows forget quickly what, what you put in. The, the answer is no, they do not. So here are, first of all, a couple of examples where I'd like to show that classical turbulent flows like a simple two-dimensional wake are self, if you know this term self-preserving, maybe self-similar, and they depend on the drag of the body that created the wave. But they are not universal. What I mean here is the following, that 
if you look at the way far downstream, essentially, if the velocity profile at the way looks like this, for all kinds of waves, and it does, once you normalize it by the velocity deficit and some characteristic weights here, then the only two parameters that are is the product, the linear product of the width of the wave and the velocity deficit, because that determines the drag once the problem is linear, as far as And yet, the product depends on the drag. The product is a given number, but the width may be very different from the velocity uh, maximum velocity deficit. And here are examples of these where this is the velocity deficit, the inverse of it, so it will be linear. And there is the length. And you ask yourself, how come there's no universality? There's no universality because the flow is sensitive to the instability. In this case, it's kelvin helmholtz type of instability. And this was taken, you see, these large eddies that were taken in two-dimensional way in a small university wind tunnel. And these are type of, the same type of large eddies that take hundreds of miles because that uh, happened to be a wake in uh, of the Madeira Island. Not exactly one-to-one -one parallel, but nevertheless, it's instructive to see. What I have here in this table was a simple strip that was put in a wind tunnel from wall to wall. But that strip could be solid, or if I make it porous, I enlarge it, and I enlarge it by trial and error until I see the drag of all kinds of strips that are more and more porous are all identical to within three significant figures. And look what happens. The theta here is within three significant figures, which means that is the, the drag of the, of the strips. The width varies quite a lot from 1.3 to 1.88. And the velocity deficit varies accordingly so that the product is exactly correct in the three significant figures. However, if you start looking at what are the instabilities that are dominating that, you see immediately that there, is, there are different instabilities. In other words, if the trip is solid, there is a region of absolute instability, and you can see that there is a reverse flow. There, there's a smoke wire here, the body, the strip is here, and there is a reverse flow that, that the smoke comes in, okay? And because of that, look at the size of the eddies that are created here. On the other hand, for the same drug, if I have porous strip, across a certain boundary where it's only convectively unstable flow, you see the type of eddies. So there's a very big difference between this and that. So here is something that we can potentially explore. Let me give you another example. Sweeping jets, I saw that you people, some started using those uh, sweeping jets. That's the, those are here, they oscillate from side to side without any moving parts, and that's their big attractiveness. Because when they oscillate, uh, they cover a large area. You're, you're, you don't have to be perfectly aligned with a certain direction, and they're forgiving. But if you have those, and you look at what happens at the surface when you use one of these, or, or here, there's one here and one here, you notice that well, this corresponds to that. So you see, there's, for some reason, there are these fixed vortices. And I ask myself, why aren't they there? Why are they, you know, living a, a time-independent structure? And there is a necklace vortex that you can see created here. And that necklace vortex depends on the velocity ratio between the jet and the free stream. 
So if the velocity ratio is very close to one, there is your lattice vortex. If it's more than three, there is your lattice vortex. If it's much more than three, the lattice vortex disappeared from here. It's absent. And so you ask yourself, how does it generate? Well, there is a vortex here that is basically vorticity created here, which the flow induced is in opposing the direction of the free stream. And so it is here. And because of that, at this region somewhere, you create, you know, you go against the stream, you create stagnation point. And so potentially, you see what happens when you have two of these jets which entrain fluids that create a region of absolute instability. And perhaps this is one of the mechanisms why these sweeping jets, it's not the entire story, one of the mechanisms why these sweeping jets uh, are so effective, and I'll show you later on why. Here is another example of um, mixing azimuthal mode and creating out of a circular nozzle, either a square jet, triangular jet, elliptical jet, this is all using the inherent, slightly in this case, slightly nonlinear instability that modifies your uh, turbulent flow. The highly turbulent flow, by the way. Uh, there is the mixing layer, which is the most fundamental, if you wish, from the point of view of Kenvin Hammond's instability. And it too, if this uh, lower stream is negative to within only 13%, uh, it was shown that uh, it would be, uh, that mixing layer would be susceptible to uh, a, a absolute instability. But even convective instability, all you need is very little actuation, and you get these large vortices, and you can control them. You can control them by a small input that creates a large output. And that uh, control, by the way, has effect on the temperature distribution as well, and so on. And that control, by the way, is mostly two-dimensional, but there's a secondary instability that results in undulation, spanwise undulation of this mixing layer, which eventually causes of wrapping one vortex against the other, and you can compute that that's relatively easy. So there are all these uh, instabilities that I think we should be able to use to our advantage. Is it correct that we use them in terms of keeping the flow attached by uh, here is a flap and there is a small oscillation, two-dimensional oscillation here and you can see these large eddies and the flow effectively is getting attached. And the answer is yes. And the answer is that it is that amplification that really gives us the leverage. Why? We start here with separated flow. And I have all these pressure sensors along the cord of the flap. And eventually, I get the flow attached. So I get this pressure distribution. You see very, uh, you know, the pressure is low at the hinge and then becomes effectively uh, uh, almost a free stream uh, CP of one near the trailing edge. And look very carefully. Here is the input of order epsilon that amplified a little bit. Then you can see, I mean, this is going further downstream. You see that the, ampli the amplitude increased. And then it reached its maximum and towards the trailing edge decreases. So there comes the thing, what is the optimal frequency that I want to put in the case like that? It's one in which I will waste as little as possible. In other words, that at the trailing edge I will have just the oscillation that will be that will suffice to keep the flow attached. So all this is in two dimensions. But there are other instabilities, particularly when you have three-dimensional. So here is an example of centrifugal instability, where I took it on purpose because this is taken from a 
Coanda cylinder, there's a jet that blows over a circular cylinder. And in addition to the classical kelvin helmholtz stack of instabilities, there's also centrifugal one. And all it takes is to have needles that protrude here 0.3 millimeters into the slot, basically hardly visible. And you can see what streamwise vortices they create. But those streamwise vortices then amalgamate in a fashion that keeps them uh, amplified. And eventually, you can see far, far downstream, they become very big. And th this is across this. And what they do, there are these vortices, which are pairs. They lift the flow on one side. They bring fluid towards the surface on the other side. And this whole question of separation over a curved surface is a very interesting one. Because in this case, I believe there's very different separation from what you are accustomed to. It's basically the liftoff of these vortices that causes the flow to separate some 220 degrees from the nozzle. It goes all around the circular cylinder and just eventually separates backwards. And why, why it is interesting, because uh, that way, here is that basically that uh, experiment, if you wish. And it, it, it's because you create a very low pressure over that whole surface, and you can therefore use it for control. Now, to just give you an example of why there is a combination of factors that's very important, you have, you can create a boundary layer, turbulent boundary layer, which is on the verge of separation. Was, the idea was uh, proposed by Stratford in the 1950s. Basically, imagine that you have a contour, a flow that the uh, contour is like that, and the boundary layer here is all the time just almost separate. Skin friction almost zero, but it's still the flow is being attached, namely pressure uh, gradient is there. And you can create the same bound, but not the same. You can create a boundary layer which is similar to it, but it doesn't have the curvature by putting a perforated plate in here and allowing the flow to go out of the time. So here you have two conditions of Stratford type turbulent boundary layer. And yet, the boundary layer is quite different. And the control of that boundary layer is quite different. In other words, there is an interaction between, because one has centrifugal instability associated with it, and therefore it has uh, streamwise vortices, the other one doesn't. And so the control of these two is very different, and yet it is important. You have the whole class of Liebeck type uh, airfoils, some of them are used on uh, vertical, um, on, on wind turbines, not just vertical wind turbines. And you want to bring this very close to separation, and you can, in fact, do so. And you can, in fact, control it. And there is the flow uh, velocity profile is almost like a mixing bed. So there it is. But you can see that with curvature, it's a different type of control that you need. And so those are details that are needed. So I hope that I convince you here <coughs> that in order to put a psylon and get one as an output, <coughs> you need to use the natural instabilities that exist. Now, I can create those if I want to start designing a wing from the beginning. So here is now another statement that I'd like to make is that there is a very close coupling then between the design of your wing, the design of your surface, and the active flow control. And this is, I believe, true for the lift and for moment and so on. Let's forget the drag because this is a more complicated issue. But 
Let's look, for example, on a tailless aircraft. And I would like to make sure that this tailless aircraft flies and it's trimmed under all conditions. So if I have this extra parameter, which is lump parameter, an active flow control, which I call mu, then I see that, the, and I want to have a trim, namely I would like to have the, the pitching moment around some axis will be zero. Then if I have two, par two parameters involved, namely incidence, or maybe actually also flap deflections or control surface deflection, which is I call here lump, uh, de uh, delta. So I have now three parameters involved and active flow control, and yet I want to have a trim. Then I go, I realize that the total derivative here is not just the partial derivative, it's not just the incidence or the thing individually. I cannot linearize, or I should not linearize, and that gives me then immediately what sort of an input of active flow control is desired in order to keep the airplane that of this type trim. So here is the other thing why we need to start from the very beginning with considering active flow control. <coughs> Where did I see it first experimentally? This was, Jim mentioned that we did this experiment on a uh, large airplane on 757. And what happened was that originally we started this whole project at NASA uh, with the vertical tail, which was supposed to be the 767. But then, for all kinds of reasons, we switched to the 757, and we had this model already initially built. So we converted uh, the one, the 767 into the 757, which has a little bit of a different aspect ratio. But what it enabled us, it gave us all of a sudden two rudders and two vertical stabilizers. And yet, we started looking at all the vertical tails of commercial airplanes. This, by the way, includes all the Boeing airplanes, all the Airbus planes, and look at something which is very interesting. The hinge between the rudder and the vertical stabilizer, when you uh, put it you know, in the same area, the hinge is at 65%. Who copies from whom? I don't know, but that's the fact. Okay? And then everybody does the same. And then, but we had this opportunity now, all of a sudden, to switch to play between 72% and 58%. Doesn't look much, right? But it became very clear that this, more, this combination of one one stabilizer and a different, different uh, rudder gave us this opportunity that this one performed best without any active tone control. In other words, for some reason, 58% was much better than 65. And however, so here is the data. This is the side force generated when the rudder is deflected versus deflection angle, and here is this model that I was mentioning 50 or percent at this point. And it did so both for a given drug, if you wish, and for a given uh, deflection of the rudder. So in every respect, the baseline is best. Now we had, because the project was initiated and by the time it was due to he uh, put in the test into the seven, uh, into the 40 by 80 wind tunnel, which is quite expensive. Uh, something of the order of $100,000 for commercial user per day. Uh, they set up a success criterion. And the success criterion is you take a tail, improve the rudder efficiency by 20%. Wow. Take that as a percentage wise, if this is your success criterion, I will now submit this totally wrong approach. Why? Because if you see those four vertical tails combination, the what happens? 
it's not like that. The one which is the green one here, okay, this is this combination uh, that I mentioned before. It does the best for all kinds of radar deflection, 20, 30, 35 degrees, and for various input now of momentum. That was our task. And yet, the one that the baseline is the worst one, okay, percentage-wise, was the best. So here is the thing, you see, the red one that is quite bad here, or the black one is the worst, is appears here almost the best, okay? In other words, that success criterion was wrong from the start. Because there's not a big trick to take something, make it bad, and then say how much I can improve. In other words, try to make it best, but try to make it already best with this other tool, and the other tool is active flow. So at the end of the day, uh, here is what was usually what is usually neglected, namely. If I have active flow control, should I have con consider it right from the beginning? And in this case, the side force is a function of momentum input due to the active flow control and the rudder reflection. And you can see that if I can increase the side force by 50% just because of the momentum input, I cannot just neglect it and linearize the problem. So here it is. And what happens? What happened in flight? What happened in flight is there were all these uh, nice tufts located on the rudder here and a little bit on the stabilizer. And you could see that the, when the rudder is deflected, if you do nothing, the flow goes up. The flow is there, even when the flow is attached, because we were not allowed to go beyond with the rudder. There's a mechanical stop. They don't touch. You are not allowed to touch it. It's an airplane. Okay. However, when we had these actuators right in here, the direction changed, and it turned out that the direction changed even if we use their. I was forced to use 31 actuators on the sweeping jacks at the hinge. But it turned out, and this was tests from the 40 by 80, we were just lucky that when we were running this test in the 40 by 80 tunnel, uh, if you may, may remember that in 2013, the government went on strike and closed down. There was an issue, right? And all the facilities were closed down. So there was air supply, and the tunnel was still running for a few hours, and we could play. So we played. <laughs> we, I, I said, kept saying, let's try one actuator. You don't need all the 30 actuators. One. And what happens? The one actuator is this blue point here. Uh, it's, it required momentum coefficient to the fraction of a percent, and it provided us with 9% increase in side force. Now, in term, think of the area ratio. The nozzle here, although it was too large because I was arguing with the CAD people, which kept telling me that I'll never surpass the inviscid limit, which is here, the nozzle of this one actuator is one eighth of a square inch. Okay, just something like that. The area of the vertical tail of the 757 is 370 square feet. The area ratio is one to half a million, 480,000 and something. Okay, nine percent is not of order of size, and the input is definitely. There was arguments about how much mass flow do I need. And of course, you want to be make sure that you are within the imposed success criterion. So we had to design the actuators to take care of something like 8,000 SCF. 
I was arguing that you don't need anything with safety factor, which is 3,000. In other words, we were talking about factors of 2030 in terms of mass flow. And it turns out that, you know, the, the system was designed, I forgot already how many pounds per, per second, and we use just a fraction of it. Okay? And so here is, by the way, one actuator. Here is three actuators. Here is five actuators. You already reached 15%. This is 12, but they ran 31 in spite of it. So you ask yourself, what this one actuator can do? It cannot cover the whole area. It's a jet. Even if it oscillates like that, it's just very small relative to the area. So it somehow redirected the flow. <coughs> and basically, because the rudder is swept back 44 degrees, and a typical uh, combat airplane, let's say of the 50s here, is a MiG-19, as a fence. So basically what you have is a, is a fence and something analogous to a fence, because it's a jet. Analogous to a jet curtain that stops locally the spinal flow. And that spinal flow can be attached. And it's actually, while it is still attached, that it is most valuable and you get most, if you wish, bang for your money. So here is an example where, you know, there are these large fences. Uh, it's a misnomer to call them boundary layer fences because 18 inch, the boundary layer on the MiG-19 may be a centimeter, not 18 inches, okay? But it helps the stability of the airplane. By the way, later on, you know, we, if you think about it, I want to use just five actuators on this vertical stabilizer all I can use is a, it's a fancy little compressor. It uh, rotates at about 200,000 RPM or whatever. It needs cooling and so on. But look at its size. It weighs uh, 10 pounds. With everything else, maybe another 20 pounds. And if I put it at the base of this vertical stabilizer of 757, there it is. So I don't need to have piping that was going all the way from the uh, APU through a cooler to the actuators, I could use a couple of these and that will do. So from the practical point of view, there is your, and, and one of these can supply enough for at least three actuators. So that's fine. Okay, so let's move to another problem, which is really the paramount problem here, and that is uh, the uh, longitudinal stability, the pitch instability of many uh, airplanes that, are swept, that have swept back wings. And they, I, this is from Forlong from the 1950, I think it was public in 1957, and you can see if one takes a wing and sweeps it back, what happens to the to the pitching moment? And when things like this happen, this is totally uncontrollable. So most of the commercial airplanes, you don't go beyond 30 degrees sweepback. Yet, you would like to have larger sweepback because uh, that will enable you to fly without uh, having shocks. Okay, at higher speed. So you can think the economy of this is, is tremendous. But there is the limit. And so then if you look at the same thing but uh, changing the aspect ratio, you can see that the aspect ratio plays a major role in the instability. So for preliminary, so first of all, what is the solution if you want to have a high-speed airplane? Have a hinged wing, and that was part of the uh, exercises and uh, you know the B1 still flies and it lands with wings that have to be hinged but of course uh, you pay a huge weight penalty when you have a uh, hinge. Oops, something happened again. 
when you have a hinge spring. So uh, there are preliminary design criteria, and these are uh, Royal Aeronautical uh, Society data sheets that show you two parameters basically which separate stable wings from unstable wings in, in pitch. And the two parameters are aspect ratio, which is the vert, the CISA here, the sorry, the ordinate, that's the aspect ratio, and that's the sweep back. And if you look at all the designs that are here, uh, there is this curve here, which uh, aspect ratio times the tangent of the quarter chord, if that is uh, larger than three, the wing is unstable, if it's smaller than 2.6, it's stable, and then in between there's some, some yes, some no. But that's not the only two parameters. And by the way, all the design of these uh, are all trying to push that curve as much to the left as possible, but they are always on the border. But those are not only the two parameters that exist. And here is an example. I uh, can only show you a lift versus the pitching moment. And there is, on this model, there is the typical pitch departure. Namely, if you want to keep your neutral point, all you can do is get this lift coefficient, which is here. If you introduce active flow control, but as you change attitude, you increase it. In other words, the two are coupled and measured. You can go from this point all the way to this point. Namely, you change the lift coefficient, usable lift coefficient, by a factor of two and a half. Whatever it is, it is. What else I, I can tell you that all this from here to here took only three degrees of incidence, and here it took a little bit more than uh, change in uh, 4.7 degrees, okay? So in other words, you can, you don't have to rotate as much, and you can get useful lift, and you can be trimmed. The trimming is the most important in this case. So that's experimental result. There's another model that was uh, given as a NATO uh, exercise is called the SACOM Stability and Control Model. And they used a lot of CFD, which, by the way, did not agree with their oil flow visualization at a relatively high mark number. This is two different turbulence models, and you can see that they don't agree with what this happens. You put in, you realize that there is a span wise, the flow is dominate. Oops. The flow is dominated by the spanwise component in, in this region in here. So you say, hey, maybe I can stop the spanwise component. And by stopping the spanwise component, let's see what happens. And indeed, we did that. And on the second model, uh, the first test we did, see there is Again, lift versus pitching moment, and this is unstable at all angles of incidence. And there is your instability here, which is really this. This is the major problem here. You put in large fences, and yeah, you do something, but not that much. You put in active flow control along this here without deflecting any surface and so on to go there. And so. Here is how we can stabilize a fine wing. And indeed, you can see that uh, we do this uh, using just four actuators, I think in this case, half a percent, one and a half percent. You can see just how we change the stability characteristics. So the question is, how, why is it happening? Why is it happening? And this is uh, partly Jim helped me here uh, by we, we were learning, or we are still learning, about pressure-sensitive paint. And you can see that here is the 
stability with the active flow control. Here is without the active flow control, the pitching moment versus uh, alpha. And you can see that uh, what happens at 11 degrees incidence, 15 degrees incidence, 17 degrees incidence. You can see what happens. There's a leading edge vortex, and it separates in here. It, I mean, it moves in the downstream direction. If you take with active flow control and subtract the contours with the active flow control from the contours without the active flow control, this is the difference that you can see in all these. And you see what happens there, where the actuators were. We lower the pressure upstream. And by lowering the pressure upstream and yet uh, downstream of the rotation point, the rotation axis is shown, this is the black line, broken line here. Obviously, low pressure in, in here means nose down pitching moment. And that's exactly what you see where instead of having nose up pitching moment, we have nose down pitching moment and constant. So the stronger this thing is adjusted, we can keep on going. We lose it here, and the question is why we lose it. We lose it because the leading edge vortex, by we are pulling it downstream, we are pulling it in the direction of the flow, it comes in here and then the flow separates into two. And if we increase the angle, you can see this is all the separated tip region. And there is this effect of the active flow control within there. And it starts losing its effectiveness because high pressure in here is, again, pitch up that is created. So the question now comes, is this the optimum type of wing configuration period? Why not? You see, this tends to separate. Why don't I con contour the leading edge in that fashion, have it separate? And of course, where I want to contour it and how do I want to contour it depends on how much active flow control I want to introduce from the beginning. So you can see how closely coupled that problem is. So. Uh, just a, an additional thing that turned out is, okay, instead of using uh, 13 actuators and so on, we use only four. We get two splitter plate and so on. And we ask ourselves, how much control can we have in yaw? Because there's a great interest of having the ability to yaw, the, in other words, to control the flight path of this of a, uh, airplane like that. Uh, can we do it without deflecting much the flap and can it be efficient? So the standard procedure is you have a split flap somewhere here, basically a split aileron if you wish to call it like that. And this is when you open that, it creates drag and this whole thing starts yawing. Well, it turns out that these jets create just the opposite effect, but it can go in the opposite direction. And that's exactly what happens. In other words, if we use just active flow control and we look at the yaw moment, this is the CLN, you can see it's constant, effectively uh, alpha. And you look how big it is relative to a 20 degree uh, split flap, which is going in here. And you lose control here. So we thought, OK, we built another one to be 30 degrees. So it, yes, initially you have more your control authority, but again, at higher incidence, you lose it. While with active flow control, you maintain it. And so that's that, and there's a comparison there from, also for DLR, which is completely larger, uh, order of magnitude different uh, Reynolds number in mind. Uh, let me go just to one more example. Uh, this has uh, recently appeared in actually in Aviation Week, Magma model. The Magma model is uh, a joint effort by British Aerospace and the University of Manchester. And they claim that they will be able to replace the conventional ailerons, if you wish, and flaps on this with Coanda effect. Namely, they'll have a circular 
training edge with a potentially having a jet coming either from the top or the bottom, and that way they will create lift and so on. Uh, it's an interesting concept. I don't know how efficient this will be. But uh, we started looking at that and said, well, I think active flow control can do better. I don't say it may be that, you know, with proper usage of all the instability associated with the water like that, they may achieve quite a lot. But at this point, they're trying to get essentially all the power that the engine it's a jet engine thing that the engine gives, push it through the through this uh, quantum system. And they still have vertical stabilizer here, which actually uh, in the British Aerospace and NATO and so on are not interested in having. But uh, for initial uh, flights, they, they do have it. So we took that wing, and by the way, this whole model was trying to solve the problem, the pitch-up problem, which you had seen before on this 1303 uh, model that was in the public domain. In the 1303, this is, I, I showed it before, there is its instability here as far as pitch-up instability. So that's the green arrow and that's the diamond. So what they did, they, they took the, this platform, added this whole piece like that, and they said they solved the problem. Well, we, we did the same, and we did not solve the problem. So our data shows that, yes, you have some improvement, but not quite. And then it turned out that uh, they changed the thickness quite substantially. So here you have the 1303 thickness, and there is the thickness of this magma model. And by changing the thickness, and yet not changing the platform at all, we got into this vertical thing, and flow uh, pitch instability occurred somewhere in there. Well, what does that show? Is that the initial preliminary design uh, curves that they have are not incorrect. They don't include everything. See, thickness, I, the same platform gives you different thickness instability. So we proved that, and then we proceeded to look at active flow control on this model. And we already had the experience, so first of all, this is, by the way, CFD are the colors, are the pressure distribution obtained by CFD. Uh, surface uh, contours, surface direction of flow are shown here, those are the lines. And we superimposed experimental tufts on that. And this is the best that uh, so far uh, British Aerospace was able to produce. And you can see that there's, and uh, this is a, exactly our Reynolds number, by the way. You see, large discrepancies. This is, uh, I think, 13 degree incidence between the direction of the tufts and the direction of the predicted flow, and primarily, of course, the discrepancies. So where did we put the active flow control on this? We put four plugs with sweeping jets at these locations. We say plugs because we know we have now enough experience to suggest that if the jet axis is normal to the local streamline, the surface streamline, you get the best interference, you get the best result. So first of all, this is where CFD comes in, which is very important. How do you start this angle? Because like, to have this thing rotating, it's not easy. If you have one or two of them on a large model, yes, it's doable. But if uh, you have just a wind tunnel model, that's a big problem. So we Manufactured for every angle, we manufactured a different plan. But it turns out, and this is by the way why sweeping jets are so much better than steady jets, because they sweep 120 degrees, so error is forgiving, much more forgiving if you have just a sweeping 
at the solution. So we had four of these, and we put one which went oscillated mostly a little bit below uh, where the attachment line is and oscillated like a fence. And here are basically, first of all, the results that we use only one of these actuators, just this actuator four. Look what we did to the pitch uh, stability here. This was the original one. We made it so much more stable, just with one actuator. So that's not a big trick in that case. But here comes then the rolling and yawing moments. Uh, and when we already do one thing, that, that one, which was vertical, uh, is subtracted from the others, because that creates extra drag, which wants the airplane to do this way. OK, if this is on this way. The other creates less drag that want to do the opposite. So you can imagine that I do, if I want double the action, I do one of that on one wing and the other on the other. In that way, we get quite a substantial yawing moment at very small momentum input. Here in the typical momentum inputs, you see, less than 1% in total. This is compared to a 10 degree uh, deflection of a control surface. So it does much better in yaw than that. And the other problem is that usually if you like the control surface, unless you do just a spoiler type aileron, you have large rolling moment and that you don't. So you can see that you have very little rolling moment associated with that and very large one associated with the fact that one uh, thing. Okay, I think I will conclude now and say the following that I just believe that um, if we were to include active total as an independent parameter right from the beginning, we would open the design space substantially. And for that reason, because there is very strong coupling between the active flow control and the shape of the wing and its cumber and its uh, sweep back and so on, that this should be done right from the beginning. And we have to find out how to do that. Secondly, active flow control is really a dynamic process. In other words, if you want to have a certain mission, if you want to have be trimmed, for example, at all kinds of attitudes throughout the flight envelope, you cannot just fix it and say, okay, now I'm approaching landing, I opened all the jets, and that's it. You have to do this uh, incrementally coupled to the airplane. And so it's both in direction and in amplitude and in location. So all these parameters have to be changed as you march along. You can say it's impossible. Yes, if I have a very large number of actuators, it would be difficult. But if I have one, that's not a big thing. Okay? And then uh, I can potentially use active flow control for yaw and roll and either add them to existing control surfaces or perhaps under some conditions of need I can supplement uh, existing control surfaces. The other thing that's interesting is the flow on a typical swept back wing is basically <coughs> the aft part of the wing is basically spun wise. It's not all the and because it's spun-wise, you may need very different input in order to create relatively large output, as was shown in this 757 vertical tech. So what we need is, first of all, a remote, a reliable CFD so that we can predict what we can do, and then apply it together with all, whatever techniques we use in the design uh, so that we can optimize the geometry and the active flow control. So that's basically all that I, I want to say. Uh, if you want to see 
I just I think mentioned to you that the damage that was created by having, uh, I mean, this was public relation damage on the 757 because we used an ATU and because there were plastic seals here between the rudder and the, and the vertical stabilizer, the air had to be cooled. The air that used the ATU had to be cooled, so they hanged out, as you see here, the hang, hang a little radiator right in here. And although the results were very competitive, the, the pilots loved to fly it with the single engine. Because they said, for the first time, they shut one engine in there and they keep on flying straight and the airplane doesn't uh, uh, oscillate all over the place nice and smooth because of the active load. And they flew much slower, by the way. Their, their test, they flew it essentially like a Cessna 182, over a point of view straight at 3,000 feet. But we got a lot of negative uh, publicity because people said, are you going now to fly with radiators and jet airplanes? Half a year or a year later came a thesis from Caltech. And they showed that the hotter the jet, the better the result. Okay? In other words, this was imposed on by, by the fact that there were, there's this plastic, little plastic sheet, uh, sheet that seals between the rudder and the uh, actual. So, anyway, thank you. Very useful 
perhaps that's the best thing one can uh, put. But in terms of the real fluid dynamics, if you are really good at it, I don't think, I'm not sure we need it. I hope I answered you. Yes? So all of the applications that you were mentioning, would you be proposing to just use the small compressors and have just a few actuators? Or are there scenarios where you can still see a bleeding of the engine? Well, the <coughs> conventional, if you wish, two-dimensional separation control. We have large reflection of a surface which the flow is primarily along the core. We probably need a larger concentration of, I would say, jets. I say jets because instead of the continuous slot, continuous slot, I think, is not a thing. The reason is that if you have jets which are discontinuous, you create on one hand, you add momentum, like in a 2D jet, but you also create sumized vortices at the edge of, of, of the no each of the nozzles. And those vortices do some job. Okay. So the number of the distribution, there, I would say, if you have most cornwise flow, the sort of standard two-dimensional separation, probably need much more. It's on the, on the swept back finite waves where we were not aware of how strong is the spanwise flow. The spanwise flow is the dominant one, particularly in the half part of the wave. And there, all you need is not the classical separation control, but just to change the direction. And by changing the direction, you can do it. Well, see? And that's, there is this difference, if you wish, in the amount of air that you need. And because again, I remember now those numbers between the predictive prediction for the 40 by 80 Newton of this came to a situation factor factor of 80 between C and D and the final. So there is a yes. Could this also not be used in non swap techniques? Like for example, my <laughs> you know what? I still worked in Boeing with a guy that was actually the chief of dynamics for the commercial airplane group. He's arguing that if I increase, if I take a winglet and put it like that, then we just, just increase the aspect ratio, I'd be better off. And it's the same guy that 20 years later started this uh, partner's company that makes all the winglets for <laughs> OK? So now, you know what? By the way, you can make the winglets much more efficient by using some That's another thing. That's another thing. But I think the success, recent success of the winglets is because all the airplanes look the same. So now you put this big winglet and the CEO of uh, Southwest Airlines stands next to that winglet. Ah, we have modern airplanes. <laughs> we are, you know, saving energy to the world. It's, I, I don't know. I mean, there, there is, people do, a lot of England, but there's a lot of controversy. 
other people's services. Then we increase aspect ratio and you get this. By the way, by that the flow control can allow you to do because we can be trimmed at zero lift and we can be trimmed at trimmed at lift coefficient of the order of one. You this the thing that I am trying to push now is the following. When you take off, you run, you initially put all your flaps down, right? not, not as, as far as you do for landing, but you put something of the order of 20% flaps down and drop the nose. In other words, you start your takeoff run at your maximum CL, at the, not the maximum CL, the maximum L over D, okay? But it's at high CL. When you rotate, you are in fact, now there's discussion whether it's 70% of the drag at rotation, take off, is drag due to lift or 90%. If you talk to uh, Ilan Crow from uh, Stanford, right? Tells you it's 90%. I think it's one of the articles of this. The question is, why not run at zero lift? In other words, I reduce the drag very substantially. And at some speed that I consider rotation speed, I drop the flap and so on. And that. If I have active flow control, I can do it and be trimmed. In other words, I don't have to suddenly do something else, okay? It can have a huge impact on the weight of the, the size of the landing gear. Because you don't have to rotate as much. So, again, if you start thinking right from the beginning, having this active flow control as a tool in mind, I think we can change it. I want to uh, thank our speaker again. Yes, yes, somebody wonderful. Well, you we can have one more question. Okay. Sorry. Uh, maybe there's a nice question. You, you define active flow control as uh, making a X amount of perturbation to the flow that eventually grows to part of one of the effect on the flow. Uh, if you have, as you said, this could have virtually uh, increased the effect of the flow control because I have an active flow control. Why does he have access to uh, R1 perturbation? What kind of flying machines would that enable? Like, what would R1 perturbations be? Uh, well, uh, look, I think all of these flying, blended wing bodies that, you know, the estimates are that the commercial blended wing body uh, could uh, improve by something like 30%. In other words, you'll be able to fly from, let's say, Tokyo to Sao Paulo without refueling, which is very substantial. So on all these machines, um, I think it can have a very large impact. The reason is that right now, for example, this blended wind body at the platform that are tested, uh, there's an airplane, X-48. Uh, I mean, it's unmanned. It's about 20 of the uh, unmanned vehicle. Uh, but this is kind of a prototype of proof of concept. Uh, it has 14 <coughs> control surfaces in order not to have pitch, in order to have some yaw control, in order not to spin immediately. There's a case. Okay. Uh, you'll have more opportunities to ask questions at the reception following the uh, this lecture upstairs in uh, E100. Please join us for some food and conversation. Please join me in thanking Dr. McNancy.